To say that a firm has market power is the same as saying that the firm has the power to set price. And the only kind of firm that doesn't have that power is a perfectly competitive firm. That's why we call it a price-taking firm. It simply takes the price that the market sets and knows it can sell any quantity it wants to at that price. For that kind of a firm, the marginal revenue from producing one more unit of the output is simply the price at which that output can be sold. So the additional revenue is just equal to the price. But what about a firm that has market power? A firm that has market power faces a downward sloping demand curve. For any price it sets, it can sell a certain quantity. It can raise that price and sell less, or lower that price and sell more. And the demand curve tells us what price the firm can set for any given level of output. Now if that demand curve is linear, if it takes the shape of a straight line, we can come up with a simple mathematical expression for that demand curve. It's just the expression for a line. So it would say that the price, given how much I produce, is going to be equal to some vertical intercept minus the slope times x. b minus mx, simple equation of a line. The total revenue the firm gets for a given amount of output is then just going to be equal to the output it produces times the price it can charge as given by the demand curve. So the demand curve tells us what price it can charge for that level of output, multiply that by x, and we get the total revenue box. But we now have an expression for p of x, just b minus mx, which we can substitute in for p of x. So that gives us b minus mx times x, which we can multiply out to get b times x minus mx squared. So this now is a function that tells us for any level of output the total revenue the firm is going to get. And once we know what the total, total revenue of the firm looks like, we can derive the marginal revenue. The marginal revenue is just going to be equal to the derivative of total revenue with respect to x. So we can take the derivative of this with respect to x, and we're going to get b minus 2 mx. Now we can put the marginal revenue curve on the same picture as the demand curve. So if we do that, we start with the demand curve. It has an intercept of b and a slope of minus m. So the slope here is minus m. The marginal revenue curve also has an intercept of b. So it starts at the same point as the demand curve. And that should make intuitive sense. The additional revenue you get from producing the first unit is equal to what the demand curve tells you you can sell that first unit at. But then the marginal revenue curve has twice the slope of the demand curve which means it's twice as steep. So twice the slope means it's going to intersect the horizontal axis at half the distance of where the demand curve intersects. And after that, it's going to become negative. So that would be our marginal revenue curve. That tells us that once we get past the midpoint of the demand curve, if I produce more output, the additional revenue I get is negative, so my total revenue is going to fall. So on this portion of the demand curve, an increase in output is going to imply that my total revenue is going to fall because my marginal revenue, the additional revenue I get from the next unit, is negative. On the other side of the midpoint, if I produce more, my marginal revenue is positive. That means my total revenue is going to go up. So on this part, if I increase output, this implies that my total revenue goes up. We can now relate that to what we learned about price elasticities of demand. 
when we talked about price elasticities for a linear demand curve, we said that at the midpoint of that demand curve, elasticity of demand is exactly equal to minus one. Above that midpoint, we were on the elastic portion of demand. The price elasticity of demand was greater than one in absolute value. Below that midpoint, we were on the inelastic portion of demand. Price elasticity was between minus one and zero. And then we talked about what this implies about consumer spending. So if we start on this point of the demand curve, consumers are going to spend this box, the price that they spend per unit times the number of units they buy. That consumer spending is the same as our total revenue box at that price. When price increases, consumers buy less and they're very responsive in terms of the percentage change in demand from a percentage change in price. The decrease in spending that happens because they spend, because they buy fewer goods, is larger than the increase in spending that happens from the additional spending because of the higher price. So the total spending box is decreasing in size. As we increase price, consumer spending, which is the same as total revenue, falls. If we, on the other hand, are on the elast inelastic portion of demand, and we raise price, consumers are relatively unresponsive. The percentage change in the quantity is small. The spending that we lose from the fact that consumers buy less is small relative to the spending that we gain from the additional spending because of the higher price on those goods that consumers continue to buy. So total revenue increases as we raise price down here. So if we increase price down here, total revenue increases. So that tells us we already know something about where a firm with market power is not going to produce. A firm with market power is not going to produce on the inelastic portion of demand. Because if it ever were to produce on that portion, it could raise price, lower quantity. By raising price, it would increase total revenue. And by lowering quantity, it would increase total revenue. So if you can produce less and increase your revenues, you're certainly going to do that. You're not going to stay on that inelastic portion of demand. Firms with market power are going to produce on the elastic portion of demand, on the portion of demand where if you increased price, your total revenue would fall. They would never be on the inelastic portion of demand.